You know, we have a joke. Not a joke. It's actually, the, there's a Malu conspiracy that goes on. So in Kerala, we know that, um, so after 12th standard, all the Malus are there. But after 12th standard, they, all the cool Malus leave to Bangalore. <laughs> no, no, Gulf is before that. After Gulf, they all come back. And then all the not so cool Malus apparently leave to Pune. I don't know. I don't know. Yes, I don't know. That's what they say, right? But the really unfortunate ones end up in Cochin itself or in Kerala. So I was one of those unfortunate Malus who couldn't leave because my parents thought that the world was, I was not ready for the world. But, uh, but that's not how I wanted to start today's session, damn it. So, um, I, okay, it, it's, you know, I started giving a lot of attention to random things that's happening in my life because when I look back, almost everything that really changed my life were things that I had least control over. This is random stuff that happened. And today morning, one of those random things that happened is on my way here while I was traveling, my co-passenger was this person who was quite interesting. We got into this conversation about life and stuff like that. And at the end of it, before he left, he said, Jitin, I think you need to be more, you know, you need to have more um, gratitude towards life. You don't, I don't think you are thankful enough about life. And uh, if you just try practicing that, probably you might be a better person. And I'm like, yes, I want to be a better person. So uh, I want to actually start. I mean, I'm actually feeling extremely happy right now because uh, I had an amazing experience coming here. I, I want to honestly, with a wholeheartedly, be glad, you know, convey my gratitude to Tanu Dhawan, who actually took really good care of me all the way till here and was also, yeah, you can give her, give her a small round of applause. It's good, it's good, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm really anxious when I come for these events like this and the ways, the, how thoughtful she was and the way she took care of me, I really feel a lot more relieved and more importantly, I know that if she's like this, the rest of the team is gonna be like that. I mean, you understand? And I have a very good vibe about SITM right now and I'm really, really excited about being here. So thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs> cool. On that note, um, my talk is about how to make change happen. And I started thinking about it because of uh, the Aam Aadmi Party. You know, it's because a uh, lot of conversations, I think one good thing that happened with the whole Aam Aadmi Party is that now everybody has, or many people started believing that, you know what, I can probably be a politician and change the way India functions. And that's a good thing. You know, if you really think about it, that's one of the best things that can happen to, to democracy where people actually feel that they can actually make a difference, right? Uh, so it is really, I mean, I really like the whole conversation. It's quite interesting. And, but one of the other interesting things that happened is that I started getting these random emails from people, I probably some of them who I, that I don't even know, saying you should probably, uh, you know, become a candidate for the Aam Aadmi Party. So, uh, first it was funny. I was like, oh wow, this is a funny, good joke. It happened a couple more times and then I, I was humbled. I was like, wow, you know what, people actually think that I can do that, that's great. But after a point, it started getting really annoying, you know, because it's annoying because I'm like, but I run an organization called Make a Difference. I get these emails which says, Jitin, I believe you can really make a difference if you join the Aam Aadmi Party and become a politician. I'm like, why, don't you think I'm already making a difference? What's going wrong here? And it actually really affected me. I'm like, Lord, there are a lot of people out there who know me well, who think that I need to be a politician to make a difference. And, and after a while I started thinking, if that's what I need to do, if I, if what I need to do is to become a politician, see, at the end of the day, I, I want to make a difference. I want to make, I want to change some things which I feel is unfair. And if that, if what it takes is to become a politician, probably I should do that. So see, as you can see, I already started dressing like one. So it's step one, my question. <laughs> but uh, I thought about it. I had a conversation with my mentor about it. I was slightly depressed about the whole incident, and then it struck me, or it did not strike me. I came through the conversation that. It just takes two things to actually change something. What, what, what makes change happen? Just two things. For change to happen, you need a solution that works and you need an institution that can deliver that solution. That's all, there's nothing beyond that. And if you think about it, that's what our government is all about. Our government is actually the second part of it. Government is an institution that can deliver an already functioning solution across the country, right? But what about the first part? If you don't get the first part right, if you don't know what the solution to a problem is, does it matter if you have an extremely efficient and uh, transparent delivery system? Because at the end of the day, we still don't know how to solve this. And I believe in India we have problems that we have not solved yet. And government is not what we should be looking at because government is not, is just a delivery system. What we need are solutions. And I work with children, uh, vulnerable children, and for us, 
vulnerable children are those who those children who are not safe in their own homes that's the best way to put it these are children who are who are on the streets uh, who have been trafficked who are uh, you know engaged in child labor or children whose parents are no longer capable of taking care of them there is a system, there is a solution that is currently in place to take care of these children and that's called orphanages and street shelters. Which is, if you see a child who is begging or uh, in child labour, you can call this number 1098 and he will be, the, there will be a team who will come, pick him up and take him to a shelter home, a government run shelter home where he is supposed to live his rest of his life, 18 years and after that he can, he is rehabilitated back into society. That's the idea behind the whole, that's a solution that's in place now. Part of my job, one of the things that I had to do was um, to uh, rescue children from the street, which basically means, uh, you know, you've seen women begging with children, the children are really small. And uh, one, one of the things was to take the child and the mother, separate them and, you know, rescue them. That was the activity. And I went through, we got like two days of rigorous training on how to go about doing it, what are the different things that the mother would do, uh, how you can protect yourself from it, how you can ensure she doesn't run away, all those kind of conversations. But none of the training could really prepare me for what I actually faced, which is that, at that moment when I, you know, we walked out, got out of the car, got to the child and snatching the child from the mother's arms, I knew for a fact that, or I was at least unsure whether the child that I'm taking will be better off in the mother's arms or in the orphanage that I'm taking her to. Because today, unfortunately, most of the children, many of we don't have concrete numbers, that's the one sad part, but trust me when I say, most children who go to a shelter home are having more problems when they leave the shelter home because of the 15 to 16 years of institutionalization that they go through. And um, they're just one bad incident away from being back in the streets that they're in. And um, we feel that's wrong. We feel that that is not a, a workable solution. And a society should be judged by the way it treats its most vulnerable. And we're not doing a good job the way we are treating our vulnerable. So this is the conversation that you know so how do how did we go about doing it that could be just a quick way to put it so what is the one thing that is that a child in a shelter home does not have that we have it is not food it's not clothing we actually did a research we we one of our researches was to talk to people above the age of 35 who were once in a shelter home and ask them what is the one thing that they missed the most what is, what affected them the most and it was not that we didn't have you know good food or whether we had torn clothes the one thing that they said was that we did not, we wish we had somebody who cared for us, for whom we mattered. You get what I'm saying? And if you really think about it, family has a profound impact on us. The thing is that it's one of those things which is so omnipresent that you don't know how much impact that they have on us. For example, like something as small as resilience and adaptiveness as a child. When you're young, when something small, something bad happens to you, you have somebody to run to and talk to about it. Probably your mother or father, they've not, they've not able to do anything about it, but having a lap, having a shoulder to just talk about it is very important. And that builds resilience. What is resilience? That something bad happens to you, you know that things will improve, so you'll, you know, you'll bounce back. But what if something bad happens to you and you, it did not bounce back when you were young? Things never improved. What happens is that after a while, it just takes a very small incident to completely break you down. And many of our children have this challenge because I remember this one incident distinctly where I went to a shelter home and a couple of kids were fighting and one kid got a little hurt, ran away. I thought he's going to run to some shelter authority. I just followed him. and But what I saw is that he, gone, he had gone to the dormitory, sat in a corner with his head between his legs and was crying by himself. And I felt that was wrong. You know, no child at that age, he'd be probably four to five years of age, uh, Ha, d deserves to have to deal with this such small problems by himself, right? And uh, that's resilience. That's just one part of what family. Somebody who's been in a good family. All of us are actually resilient. We're here today. When something bad happens, we're able to survive it because we had a family to support us. There are other things like exposure. You know, children in shelter homes don't get to leave the shelter home much. They spend a lot of time in the four walls, and hence the whole Shawshank Redemption kind of thing, which is that when they leave, it becomes a cultural shock to a great extent. Another area is education, right? Education support, like none, like none of my kids really, education, 95% of children do not finish 12th standard in a government um, shelter home, right? And uh, a lot of people believe that's because, you know, they are from that kind of a background, their, their brains are not so developed. It's not that, the, that's not the case. It's just that 
we lived our entire life where education was everything. Our parents constantly told us, okay, you want that cycle? Get 90%. Right? Or you, you, you know, anything and everything you want in life, education was the only way. That is what was taught to us. That to achieve anything in the world, all you have to do is study hard and everything is possible. That is not happening in our shelter. I mean, when, think about it, right? We grew up in an environment where there were two caregivers for every child. They are growing up in a, and, and trust me, I mean, at least in my case, my parents did not have an easy time just handling just me. So think about a shelter home where for every 40 children, there's a maximum of three caregivers to look after them. The support system is simply not there to actually help a child become a full-fledged child. And the final problem, one that touched my heart the most is, imagine at the age of 18, you were told that, you know what, we have given you everything you have, you need, we have given you education, now you are on your own, you need to take care of yourself. How many of us would have been sitting here? I, I'll guarantee you, 95% of the people in this audience wouldn't be sitting here if you had to earn your living and study at the same time at the age of 18 to for the rest of your life. And if something happens to you, like you fall sick for 10 days, you're literally out in the streets. These are the challenges that children in shelter homes face and that's the problem. That's a problem and what could be the solution for this, right? And uh, We've been discussing a lot of different things, but finally, MAD, we have a solution. The solution that we have is that for every orphanage that has got 200 people living in it, 200 children living in it, there are 20,000 people living around it. If we can activate just 2 to 4 percent of that population to genuinely care for the children, not like don't get them excited, there will be people in that community who genuinely care for children and want to do something about it. If we can just activate them, ensure that there's a platform for them where they can actively work with the child and form a bond with the child. Then the whole system can be fundamentally different. So in MAD what happens is that from the age of 10, every child has got three mentors who's from the community itself, who genuinely cares for this child and works with him. And initially it might be about, you know, it might be art and drama, but as he grows older, it goes into education. As he grows older, it goes into career awareness. As he grows older, it goes into other activities. Like for example, one of my kids is going to get married next year. And you know, now we're going to have conversations about family planning and stuff like that. Right? So the most powerful thing that I feel this model that we've created is that by the time the child reaches 18 years of age, in the early situation, he needs to be, he needs to go back to the same community that he came from. And the reason he was in this, in this space in the first place was because a lot of the challenges that he faced in the community. But what we're able to do is create an alternate community for him, not a substitutive community, which is that we don't want him to completely leave his community behind, but also create a support system on the side where if something goes wrong, especially if you're a girl, especially if you're a girl and you are married off and you don't have a family, what happens if your husband abuses you? You have nowhere else to go. You're stuck there. But a mad child will never face that. Because she's got at least 10 to 20 mentors who in the last 5 to 10 years have formed a strong bond with her and ready to support her. And this is not a large scale system that cannot be managed. This is the system that we are creating is very one on one. The reason I still work with my 10 children is because I care for them and I work with only 10 children. It's not beyond a limit and the new mad volunteers have to only work with 2 to 3 children. So what I'm trying to say here is that a solution is as important as the delivery system. So the question that comes to us is that, but is this model really scalable? You know, currently we reach out to 5,000 children and uh, we've created communities like what I've just spoken across 85, 85 such communities across 23 cities. But still, at the end of the day, we're reaching out to just 5,000 children. And there are a lot more children out there that needs to be reached out to. And uh, what we believe is that it, we are not into incremental growth anymore. For us, MAD is nothing but a huge design lab a testing space. Today in our 23 cities, we have juvenile homes, we have children who are affected by AIDS, children who are physically handicapped, mentally handicapped, uh, children who are from all kinds of backgrounds. And for us, this is an amazing space for us to test out various solutions that we can implement so that one day we can stand up with enough data and tell the government that, you know what, these are the things that you need to do to ensure that when a child walks into a shelter home, he is fully rehabilitated by the end of the day. And that, and someday when we have that, we'll be able to lobby the government and make that a policy and ensure that it gets delivered across the country. So, for me, the 
last point that I want to kind of make here is that the young people sitting here, I mean, what's the role? If you really think about it, young people are not really given too much importance in our society. If you really think about it, like, when is the last time your parents made a decision about selling land and they called, okay, boy, come here, sit. We, just, we plan to send this, sell this family property. What is your opinion about it? Nobody asks us, right? I mean, young people are not taken too seriously. But the fact is that we should be. We should be taken very seriously because if you look at the biggest movements that has changed the face of the world, young people had a very strong role to play in it. Look at, the, look at the civil rights movement, look at the latest Arab Springs movement, look at the hippie movement. Young people had, have a very serious role to play. We are catalysts in a society. And if you think, look, look, look at the world around us, our generation is very different from the generations that, uh, you know, before us. Because our, my dad, if he did not get into a job and work throughout the year without changing the job, like through, all throughout the like, la last 30 years of his life, he could not feed his family. He did not have the luxury of taking a gap year and thinking about what he wanted in life. He did not have that luxury. But me on the other side, I know for a fact that even if I don't work for the rest of my life, there is enough money. I come from a middle class family. But still there is enough money in my middle class family to sustain myself. And so there is also this loss of purpose that a lot of us face, which is that my dad has this purpose. You know, I need to feed my family and my, my, you know, my dad and mom and my children. So I need to work hard. I don't even have that. I'm like, even if I don't do anything, my, pa my parents will survive. There's nothing I need to do. But if you really think about it, that's also an amazing opportunity. Because this really gives us, you know, that time. I mean, it just gives us this five minutes to just step out of those rat race that we are on, where we're constantly thinking about, okay, fine, you know, what job to get, what do we do? Just step out of it and say, as, as she mentioned, what do we want? What do I want? What what change do I want to create in this world, right? And that's when you're going to probably come to some really interesting conclusions. And my only hope is that your conclusion would be, you know, I mean, think about it. What do you want your legacy to be? Do you want it to be that, you know, in my entire life, I increased Synthol's profit margin from 5% to 7%? Or do you want it to be that, yeah, I tackled one of the biggest problems that India faced and I found a solution for it before I was dead. And I hope, I hope, I really hope that you guys will choose the second one. Thank you.